Awesome. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? I'm pretty loud, so it usually isn't too big of an issue. Um, so anyway, yeah, uh, thanks a lot. I'm really happy to be here. I've, uh, who here is, this is their first security conference. Good. This is actually my first security conference, too. I'm not normally kind of in the security world, and I don't know if that was the reason why, you know, James wanted me to talk here, but, you know, I talk more kind of in the DevOps spaces, and, you know, we talk more about getting developers and operators working better together, and that always bugged me in the earlier days of DevOps. Uh, because I was always thinking, like, well, what about, you know, QA teams? What about support teams, sales, marketing, you know, executive teams? What about security teams? What about all these other groups of the business that is probably also not working well together? How do we get everything together? And we've seen over the years it's been more of a cultural shift company-wide needed to really adopt a lot of the DevOps practices. So, so real quick, just who I am, just Pete Cheslock. You can find me on Twitter. I work for a company called ThreatStack. Uh, who here who does not know me uh, has heard of ThreatStack before? Awesome. This is actually good. So I like, you know, clean room of people. So I work for a company called ThreatStack. We're a new company. We started last year. We're based out of Boston, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, we do uh, continuous security monitoring, looking for internal threats, external threats, and all this stuff. If you're curious for more, I'd love to chat with you about it. But the most important part is, again, I'm not an InfoSec person. I've never really been in that space, in that community. Um, I've been more of an operations person. I've been a sales engineer. I've been a network person. I've been kind of all over the place. Um, and so this talk is a lot of what I've actually had to learn on, you know, on demand while working at ThreatStack while scaling our platform from ingesting essentially zero events into billions of events per day. Um, so James asked me to talk and this, I was like, really? Are you, me? Like why I'm not a security person? Like what do I have to say? Um, and he was like, well, you know, we're talking more about DevOps and how do you get people to work together? Um, and so, more recently, what I've seen, though, if you look at DevOps Days conferences, of which there's like 20 of them now every year, you'll see more security content coming out. More people are talking about it as more and more issues are happening. But if you look back in, in older conferences and older talks about high-velocity web operations, you know, systems engineering stuff, no one's talking about security. It was always like, how can we do things faster and faster and faster? That was most, most of the thing. So I'm only going to spend one time, one slide on what is DevOps and... Um, it's, it's a great quote from a friend of mine. Oh, man. I, sorry for that animation. I hate those things. Uh, so this is probably one of the best quotes I've seen about DevOps from a friend of mine. He says, you know, DevOps means giving a shit about your job enough to not pass the buck. It means giving a shit about your job enough to want to learn all the parts of your business. I think this actually applies as we talk about security as well and, and security teams. Just because I'm an operations person doesn't mean I get to ignore the security aspect. And that's stuff that, you know, if I don't know it, I need to learn it. And that's why I love coming to events like this to learn from, you know, the community. So in the past, I have had to work with auditors. I've had to go through audits myself, and I've worked with dedicated InfoSec teams. Um, I've realized that I think we're, we're reaching this inflection point where we have to start seeing how security teams are kind of off in their own silo with these you know, DevOps teams, Dev and Ops teams together. Um, and, and what I think is happening now is, is some of those walls are getting broken down. Um, if you've been to a, kind of a devops -y type talk, you might have seen this wall of confusion. In the past, it was the dev on one side and the ops on the other side. And I think what's happened now is, you know, the dev and ops, like, they're all happy and they're, they're doing all this continuous fun stuff. And the security team is on the other side. And they're just getting all this stuff kind of thrown over to them. So the dev and the ops, they're living in perfect harmony, right? They're embracing change. They're embracing continuous delivery. And, and maybe the InfoSec team isn't being included. Maybe the InfoSec team doesn't want to be included. Um, before the DevOps conversation really started, operations teams did, generally didn't like change. Because change brought instability, and instability woke him up in the middle of the night. So James was actually talking about the broke the internet one. I, I kind of, I, I, you know, put the little overlay on top of it, and I was like, haha, that's funny. And then, like, it got on the internet, and people loved it. But, you know, this is, this is what it feels like, right? Uh, for InfoSec teams, change brings fear, it brings uncertainty. And since you never included your InfoSec team in your fancy new continuous build pipeline, uh, you have all the software now that is largely untested uh, for vulnerabilities. So security is on the minds of everyone. I don't know if anyone follows the food lab. I, I love to cook. Uh, and so it's pretty much like when the food lab guy is saying, hey, FYI, like GoGo -Go is, you know, basically hijacking your SSL connections, you know, keep that in mind. Um, I think we're at a point where it, it is on everyone's mind. And it should be on everyone's mind in your company. So, um, yeah. So I noticed one thing when I started getting into security stuff, because I didn't know a lot about security. And I, I was trying to learn more about it. And I realized that there are the things that we should be doing, uh, which is washing your hands. 
And there's the things in security that I think I see a lot of doing instead. Things like emergency, the cocaine tooth drops, a lot of things that probably are not actually helping you out. Um, and I think that this is what this talk today represents, uh, to, uh, is that I, I really want to teach you if you know how to wash your hands, essentially. More likely, I'm actually going to tell you about how I learned to wash my hands while operating the ThreatStack platform. But uh, I know a lot of keynote talks are more vague and kind of give you some ideas to go on. But I'm going to do a little bit of that. But I'm actually going to dive into it as well. And my only hope is that there might be some things you're going to look at and be like, oh, that's beginner stuff. Like, you know, we're already doing that. But it's probably not beginner to someone. Because last year, a lot of the stuff in the talk, I was like, oh, yeah, sure. Like SSL, I guess we should have that, right? But what does that really mean? Um, so I'm a huge West Wing fan. Anyone here like the West Wing? Couple hands, all right. The West Wing's a great show. I mean, I usually get a few more hands than that, but. <laughs> so there's a great quote from it. Uh, the most costly disruptions always happen when something that we take completely for granted stops working for a minute. And when I saw this, when I, when I experienced an issue a few months ago, this quote just like came to, uh, came to my mind. So I was working on our platform, a new version of Linux kernel came out, and it was a security update. So I'm thinking to myself, all right, I'm a security-minded person. I'm going to start baking some new images, starting testing it out. And I ran into a very interesting bug. So with a specific version of the kernel that I was running, uh, this is uh, Ubuntu specific, if you're curious, uh, which was supposed to be security update only. If you ran any sort of tool that integrated with the kernel audit API system, uh, like an audit D or like our threat stack agent, um, you'd enter into a scenario where no one, including the root user, could actually run commands or fork processes. So it was a very secure security update. You couldn't actually do anything. Um, now you're thinking to yourself, OK, it's fine. I'll just log into the, the console, and you know, I reboot to the old version of the kernel. This is in the cloud. I don't have a console. You just have to like, nuke these boxes and rebuild them. So. But you see that to upgrade my security, upgrade my kernel with a security release to make my system more secure. But it'll, it'll now make it unstable, but only if I'm actually running a tool that is supposed to help me stay secure. So this is why we can't have nice things. Because I'm trying to do these very simple things to stay secure and you know, getting blocked along the way. So you say you're building secure systems, but how do you know that something that you're already using today isn't fundamentally broken? We use lots of software, lots of open source software, and we depend on them to keep us safe online and keep our systems secured. But we find later they're truly exploitable, right? Heartbleed was the, the, probably mo the, mo the biggest example of this one. And it was exploitable for years, uh, potentially, uh, before we even learned about it. And Heartbleed was really bad, no doubt. Uh, the idea that someone could just snap your private key off the server, you'd never even know about it. The joke I make with this one is, I don't, I don't have data centers anymore. I'm in the cloud. Like, where do I go to cry? Um, th the next one was the Bash bug, shell shock, a remote code execution through Bash. I mean, these were days when I'm just thinking, you know what, computers, we've had a good run. I'm going to open a meatball shop. It's going to be great. So what about uh, vulnerabilities with curl? You know, it's a really good thing that we actually don't use bash or curl to install software, because that would be really crazy. So for those people, I gave this talk at a conference, and it was a bunch of Windows people. They had no idea what I was talking about with curl bash. But uh, for those of you that don't know, there is this strange prevalence to make it very easy to install software. It involves just downloading the script from the internet and running it, sometimes with sudo, sometimes with not. It doesn't really matter either way. Um, and so I'm not going to hate on the curl bash. And I, I think there are, there are reasons why it exists. Um, but I have some issues with it, as you should as well. And as you're about to see, I have issues with a lot of things, really. Um, so for many years, again, I said this before, as an ops person, security has been an afterthought, right? I've got only so many cognitive resources for my daily activities. And I've worked in a lot of high growth startups, so you're spending all your time keeping the application running, keeping the systems going. You're not really thinking about the security aspect, right? You're just trying to keep the lights on. Um, but I try to do the right things. I use strong passwords, least privileged access, um, look for unauthorized access on my systems. But again, it's an afterthought. And security updates, I mean, I think a lot of people and a lot of companies I run into, you know, they don't even know how they do their security updates and do they update and you know, how are they testing those updates. And again, how many times has some simple security patch, simple patch release, included some breaking product change? The worst thing I've ever seen is a database that will not be named they uh, had this vulnerability that was remotely exploitable, but you could only get it if you updated to the, the next minor release, which is kind of a big deal for a database holding many terabytes of data. So there's a lot of systems out there also that take a really casual approach to security. And I think it's time that we start recognizing that a lot of these new tools, they do enable us to work better, but they also introduce a lot of attack vectors. You know, Think of, I'm sure everyone in here can think of many databases off the top of their head that have completely unauthenticated curl access to, right? 
pretty much not logged. You can just go in, you can drop your whole database. And I've seen people just do that, right? That's not even a malicious activity. That's just someone making a mistake, right? Um, but this is where risk assessment comes into play. And it's not just something for the auditors. This is something that we're actually doing as systems builders, operators, and application developers uh, every single day. Because consider this scenario. One of your engineers comes to you and says, we want to replace Postgres with you know, new hipster DB. You're going to apply this formula, which is going to basically tell you that those developers are now going to be on call anytime new hipster DB has some issues. But I think you need to acknowledge, though, that even if you don't have this dedicated security team, which for a lot of companies they don't, um, this is, again, you can't pass the buck. Um, just because it's, you don't have a dedicated team to focus on it doesn't mean that it's no one's job. So maybe you or your security team, if you are lucky enough to have one, are going to make these same risk assessments when maybe you're choosing a new SaaS service, uh, maybe some sort of third-party logging tool you're going to use, or maybe some new internal database. You know, this is uh, specific questions like, you know, what kind of data are we sending there? You know, what if that system's compromised? Um, what happens if, if that data gets out in, into the public? How valuable is that data? Is the data have any value at all? Can you scrub it before sending it? But I don't think this should be an excuse to not use SaaS services, because you should still be doing the same questions when you're uh, running new services internally as well. So you understand the risk when you're looking at a SaaS service, absolutely. Um, and I only say when using SaaS services, it's, it's the classic own your availability, but it's also own your security. Um, and security, availability, performance, these are not features. These are the core pieces of applications that you're building. So, so I want to dive in now. This was you know, kind of the, the high you know, level view of some things. But now I'm actually going to dive in specifically fairly fast and furious into a bunch of things that I actually learned. And a lot of these things, I, I always think to myself, ah, they're so basic. I don't even know why I go through this stuff. But then I chat with people, and they're like, wow, like, I wasn't even thinking of that, or never even knew that existed. So I always feel like there are a few things that you can learn from basically from what I had to learn last year. <laughs> so it's 2015. When you talk about configuration management, I feel like it's, it's a non-start. You have to have something. You could have bespoke bash scripts. I know Ben at Etsy has you know, really well-crafted crocheted uh, shell scripts for their stuff. Um, but they also, you know, you can use Chef Puppet. It doesn't matter what you use. What's that? <laughs> so the beautiful thing about configuration management is obviously your infrastructure is now as code. But if it's as code, it's testable which means when new security updates come out, you can deploy those, you can test them. And you can also move very quickly. When the inevitable next uh, OpenSSL issue comes out, your ability to move quickly to update those changes uh, you know, could be, make a big difference in the grand scheme of things. So at a previous company, I worked with our security engineers with a tool called Test Kitchen. Uh, any, anyone here have heard of Test Kitchen before? It's, uh, it, it's uh, basically a test suite that wraps on top of a tool called Vagrant that you can use to build systems. And what it can do is you can have, let's say, a chef cookbook that defines the state of your infrastructure. And so what I did was I went to our security engineers and I said, hey, if you run this command, you can build one of our base boxes, which is a box that has all of our default configurations for stuff. And they started going through that and creating audit rules and making changes. And then once they started learning about how we were building systems, then they started to build their security monitoring on top of it. And they were shipping uh, configuration management code for Audit D, for OSEC for various application stuff that they wanted to monitor. And then auditing, they started creating tools that could audit the systems you know, on the fly. But the most important thing is that they started deploying these application changes in the exact same pipeline we were using for application development and for systems development. So I want to talk about bug bounties real quick. I think it's amazing that a company like United, and any United employees here? No? OK, good. So I, I don't fly United for very specific reasons. Uh, but I think it was really a game changer when, when I, I would say a company like this says, hey, we have a bug bounty program, here's how you contact it. You know, there are companies that can help you with this. Um, even if you don't have a specific bug bounty program, have a place in your site uh, that people can go and report issues to. Um, give them a way to contact you securely. And sadly, you'll probably end up using PGP for this. Uh, we'll talk more about PGP later. So shared secrets is a very hard problem. Um, and I think this is one of the, the hardest problems when we talk about, I have this application and I need to talk to a database, where do I store those secrets? And not only is it difficult when sharing secrets between maybe two engineers working with each other, it's obviously very difficult in the systems world. Um, but the best advice I can give on this one is just don't put this one off for another day. And I don't think you need a, re a very complex solution for this one. Um, I've seen passwords stored in like wiki documents. That is bad. You don't want to do that. Maybe you want to grab like one password and have a shared vault that you can share with people or LastPass or something like that. But no matter what, I always try to say make sure it's open source crypto. If it's not, it's just kind of a big question mark. 
Um, but we need to stop with passwords and wikis, committing your secrets to GitHub. There was a blog post recently about a developer who spent an inordinate long amount of time basically saying how this bug in his um, you know, Visual Studio caused him like an $8,000 Amazon bill because you know, he committed to a private repo, but there was a bug and it made the repo public on GitHub. Well, it wasn't so much that there was a bug in his editor. There absolutely was. But the fact that he was committing AWS root access keys into source control, there are scanners on GitHub. The second you put it on there, it's like within minutes you'll see people using it. So, so we need to find a better place for these things. And what's amazing is there's a ton of awesome open source tools that are available. If you are running on Amazon, some of them use kind of the Amazon key management service, but a lot of these do not. Um, just a couple of quick notes. Vault Project is a, a, from a company called HashiCorp. Um, they've created a lot of other kind of systems tools and uh, a lot of different backends it supports, uh, easy to set up. Um, there is a tool called Red October by Cloudflare. This came out maybe a year or two ago. This is a very interesting way to store high value secrets where it requires multiple people's keys in order to decrypt the secret. So if you have really high value like SSL keys or something. Uh, and then JAS, uh, this is a tool uh, that allows you to share secrets using SSH keys. Um, we use this uh, at Threadstack all the time uh, because everyone has an SSH key to log in to the system. So we, we have our bastion host. They need SSH for that. They already, the key's already there, um, and it makes it very easy to share these secrets around. Um, does anyone know what this is a picture of? Uh, these are literally the only security is that that webcam has no public IP address. Um, but what you're looking at are two-factor tokens in a data center with a webcam so that people don't actually have to hold on to them. This kind of defeats the point of two-factor. Um, but let's talk about two-factor, right? So everyone in their pocket likely has a two-factor device on them right now. You have you know, Android phone, iPhone, some sort of smartphone. So I'm a huge fan of Duo Security. Uh, they do not pay me to shill for them. I'm happy to shill just for free because it's such an amazing tool. If you're not using two-factor in your systems, go and do it now. Get your high-risk systems, VPN servers, Bastion host, whatever. Um, there's also, is anyone using the Yubi keys? There's these little tokens for one-time password generation. Um, websites are now getting support for the you know, unified two-factor authentication programs so that you can have legitimate two-factor to log into things without typing you know, a five-digit, six-digit code or whatever. Uh, but if you're talking for your company, Duo is a couple bucks a month. The Yubi keys for one-time password generation stuff, those are $20 or something like that. So it's like $20 is all in. I personally sleep better at night knowing that everyone at my company has you know, that set up. Um, so email encryption is still a thing that is painful. Um, and email is just one part of company communication. Uh, you know, we have the Slack channel, right, for, for LASCON. People might be using HipChat or IRC. You know, your, your IRC server is internal, but, you know, how big is your company and can people sniff that traffic? Is it SSL? Who, who really knows, right? So the only, look, when I ever talk about kind of communication systems, the ultimate thing I say is just don't trust it, right? Um, Mistakes happen, people drop sensitive data in chat. Um, but I always flip this over into how quickly could you roll credentials for your whole company uh, for, for critical systems? Uh, I can remember many situations where the first engineer at the company has been there for, for many, many years, and then suddenly he's not there anymore, and someone comes to you and say, hey Pete, I need you to roll all the credentials that Bob had access to. It's like, well, you know, that's pretty much everything in this company, right? So how quickly can you roll those credentials? Have you tested that? Um, you should test that like you should be testing your backup. Um, so something I did at ThreatStack was, uh, in order to, I don't want to say enforce PGP, well, I was forcing everyone to use PGP, uh, because I wanted to make it so that everyone had it set up and ready to go for email. Uh, so what I did is I actually, uh, to basically enforce everyone in, is I set up our VPN servers and we had set up scripts that would basically create your VPN bundle and then encrypt it with your PGP key. So they didn't have to have PGP, but if they didn't, they couldn't actually log into anything. So the best way to get people to use PGP is to force them to use PGP. Um, and to be honest, I got so much, so much shit over this one. People complained and complained, and I could have just ripped it out in a heartbeat. I really could have. But we took our time, we iterated, and we improved the user experience to the point where our salespeople have PGP, our CEO does, like every single person has it. There's a little bit of upfront you know, cost, but then it does pay for itself later. So let's talk about packaging. This is actually a picture of me trying to build a Debian package. Um, so a lot of people are like, well, wait, why is packaging a security issue? And, and it's mainly the prevalence of how we are seeing software being installed today. Just curl this script down from GitHub or just clone this repo or whatever. You know, everyone wants to have this one line installer to make it very easy. And I understand why it exists. We have this thing called time to value. Uh, so if you have a, a product that you're trying to sell to someone, the quicker that they can get up and running with your application, your product, and get value out of it, 
the more likely they are to buy it. That's why that thing exists. Uh, and going through some like 10 step setup document to, to start using your application, um, it's highly likely that by step five they're gone and they're gonna go try someone else. So curl bash is not the worst thing ever. I don't like it and I don't recommend it. But honestly, if you go to ThreatStack, we have a curl bash because people have asked for it legitimately enough. And so what I usually recommend is, is grab that script and just take a peek. And what you'll see ours does is it sets up a repo and it sets up the keys and then it app get or yum installs the whatever. Um, because what you want to ensure is that that data is not changing behind you, right? And that's why we have these signatures. The nice thing is with packaging is that sometimes it works and sometimes it works great. And then other times things get tricky. So this is something I ran into last year where I was building packages, Debian packages, RPM packages to work on you know, different Linux systems. And uh, you know, did a lot of reading about PGP and kind of the consensus was you create you know, PGP key and then you dole out sub keys and you sign your packages with those. And I read a lot of, lot of uh, you know, articles about it and that was pretty much what everyone said. So I said, great, I, like, again, security minded individual, I'm gonna give that a shot. So I worked with you know, Debian packages, signed them, everything was fine. Then I go to the RPMs, it didn't work. I got a very cryptic error. So I went to Google and I searched on this cryptic error and there were like four results. So like you know, like no one's ever done this before, right? So I find this blog, uh, this, uh, this blog post and you probably can't see the date, it's November 29th of 2006. This is actually the, the person who's implemented RPM, uh, the actual RPM tool at, at Red Hat. And so what he says is, for what it's worth, I have most of the subkey implementation done, but that still won't solve your problem as it will be years before the implementation is widely deployed. So we're, we're going on 10 years, I'm feeling good. Anyone work at Red Hat here? No one? No. I'm still trying, like a bottle of scotch if they just ship this thing out there, like whatever needs to get it done, so. Um, so when we talk about packaging, uh, and, and when we just kind of randomly download scripts from the internet. I see this also internally as well. I see where people just, oh, just clone the repo and, and compile that code on the server. And there, there are many reasons why that's wrong and I, can, I could spend a lot of time talking about them. Find me later when I'm, when I'm drinking and, and i probably share that with you. Um, but one thing I do recommend is this, and this is actually a process that we follow internally when we build our packages. We take our source, we compile it. You know, there's testing that's involved with this as well. We build our package and then we sign it. And then we test those signed packages and then we can ensure that that package integrity maintains throughout the whole pipeline after the fact. And so when people say, oh, like I hate curl bash and it's like, well, how do you deploy your code? It's like, well, we've cloned from GitHub. It's like, no, 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 like you can't, be, you can't hate one and be okay with the other. Um, and the nice thing is, is that there are a bunch of tools that can help you with this. So you might notice that this talk is maybe a little bit more slanted on like the Debian Ubuntu world. That's just kind of the world that I've been living in. Um, there's, if you're on you know, Red Hat, you can create an, a package repository very easily with one tool that just works. Uh, the Debian, I have like 18 versions of that tool that all work in a very different way. Um, but there's a few things that I've used uh, personally. One's called Aptly, which is a newer tool to, to make repo creation easier. Uh, this thing, Deb S3, allows you to create Debian repos on S3, on the cheap, uh, really nice. Uh, and then there's a, a, a tool called Package Cloud. This is actually a company, uh, and they're trying to make packaging delivery easier. Um, if you have an open source project, you can host it with them for free. So you can get your customers and your users of your project uh, downloading packages uh, from them, signed packages, um, which I would say is better than you know, randomly curling stuff. So, um, so let's talk about SSLs. Certificate. So when realavocadofacts.com has an SSL certificate, you should have an SSL certificate. We already know that Google gives you higher search results if you are SSL. Uh, but I say you should have real certs as well. I've seen companies say, well, we have an internal CA, it's cheaper that way, whatever. It's like, okay, well, how do you, how do you get the CA search? All? Well, we just tell people to click, okay, it's fine, it's ours. It's like, you're defeating the point of SSL. Just buy a real certificate, it doesn't cost that much. The cost is so low, and now with the Let's Encrypt project, this is like a no-brainer. When they start doling out certificates for people, it's gonna be like time to start SSL shading people, I think. But take the time to set up correctly, and not to say it's easy, right? We're dealing with decades of technical debt. So, pop quiz, anyone know where the open SSL default store of trusted CA files is? If you guess some other goddamn place, you are probably right. Uh, because there is no reason that anyone, there's no incentive for people to improve these systems. And I think that's the sad thing. I think we should improve a lot of the user experience around how we build and how we test and how we secure systems. But don't just set them up as well. I always tell people, you know, monitor them as well. Because, and, and let, let they who have not let a certificate expire cast the first stone, right? <laughs> but gmail.com certificate expired, that, that was actually an issue with their, with their uh, intermediate CA. 
Instagram certificate expired. I actually had three other slides of, of other issues where the Microsoft cloud went down uh, like four years ago because their cert expired. And then it happened again two years later. And everyone's like, how can, it, how can their cert expire after two years again? How can they let it happen again? And it's obvious, isn't it? Someone bought it four years ago and then forgot about it, left the company, and now it expired and no one, no one knew it was there. Uh, so call us. I think they actually might either be here or be a sponsor. I don't, I don't know. But anyone use the SSL Labs testing site? If you don't know about this, uh, you should really do it. It's an amazing service. This was so helpful for me, as I would say an SSL newbie, to figure out if my application was secure in any sort of way. But not only that, they'll tell you, you know, they've essentially gamified web security, right? Like, do you know how badly I want to get 100 in every column? It's, it kills me that that's at a 90, right? But it's an A+. Plus. It's an A+. Plus. That's fine, right? Um, I actually did spend the time, more than I would like to admit, getting to 100. And it turns out there's only like three browsers on the planet uh, that, can, that can view your content when you get to 100. So <laughs> there's a balance, right? You have to balance it out. Um, what's really great about um, that, uh, the SSL Lab site, is they have an API. So, so we use a tool called Sensu. It's for our host-based monitoring. Sensu also will check you know, whatever script we run. So we just created some, some Ruby scripts that contact the site. They test our public-facing SSL certificates once a day because they constantly update. So like when some new vulnerability comes out and it drops to a B because you don't have whatever or you're writing an older version, we get notified right away. Um, and this has been incredibly helpful for us. So um, any, any users of Audit D OSEC here? Raise a hand. Anyone love Audit D OSEC? All the hands go down, right? So, um, so these two tools, uh, for those of you that don't know, so Audit D is the uh, user space component of the Linux audit system. It essentially lets you see all the system calls that are happening, a full audit trail of everything happening on your system. OSEC is a host intrusion detection system. It does some other stuff and file integrity monitoring and, and things like that. Uh, but right now, these, these are, you know, everyone kind of lowered their hand when I said, does anyone like it? And, and I think that's sad. I really wish that. You know, that's a Red Hat project. I really wish they would spend more time on improving it because um, if the user experience isn't good for an operator, if, it's, if they're constantly battling your head with something like that, you're going to turn it off. And SE Linux is a great example, right? Granted, your application may not work with SE Linux, but stop disabling SE Linux. That's always the thing on a site. It's like, oh, I tried running this database. It doesn't work. It's like, oh, did you just, just turn off SE Linux? It's like, well, that could actually save you in the future. Um, so. You could take that data out of tools like OSEC, uh, Audit D, and even if you do absolutely nothing with this data, if you have the ability to take it and save it, you can start generating graphs. So this is actually, uh, any, I don't know if anyone uses a tool called Logstash. This is a, the, the, the Kibana dashboard. You can start graphing these changes of things that are happening. Um, so even if you do, you don't alert on it, you just save this data, you can start getting some pretty valuable insights. Um, you can also use commercial tools. So if your company you know, ha has Splunk, if you're, if you're lucky enough to be able to afford it, um, you, know, you can use Splunk and you can do the exact same thing. And your continuous security monitoring, it shouldn't have to stop at your host. Uh, if, if you're on Amazon, they have CloudTrail service. Um, it's a free service. It generates all the API calls of everything that's happening. So as you start kind of moving into this DevOps space and giving people broader access to systems, um, you know, you can basically monitor for what they're doing. So I have some alerts. We actually feed this stuff into our, in our, into our, our application. And I have alerts set up that say if, if a run instance has happened and it's not inside of an autoscale group, then I want to get an alert. Because that's a scenario that shouldn't happen for us. So I don't think you need high-tech solutions to these problems. I did talk about some of the specific kind of technology things, kind of the more, you know, how to wash your hands idea of security. And a lot of that stuff is what I learned. But do you have an incident response plan in place? What happens if you lost your laptop at this conference? Do you know who to call? Um, don't discount the, the benefit of training, teaching, and most importantly, a blameless security postmortem. So I think this applies kind of company-wide because if employees uh, are, are afraid to come to you and tell you that, oh, I clicked this link and it was, and it was you know, did something odd, uh, or I went to this website and, and, I, and something was strange, if they're afraid to come to you and, and essentially tell you these things, because they don't want to get blamed or yelled at, they're just going to stop coming to you, right? It's not like the bad things are not going to happen. They're just not going to tell you when it does. So have a policy, just a simple policy for different parts of your business, right? Keep it simple. I don't think you need you know, an ITIL instant response plan. Maybe not yet. Um, so something that I like to do in like a lost laptop scenario is we have use PagerDuty. It's a way to alert people kind of based on the schedule. And so if someone loses a laptop, I've told everyone, like, if I get a call at 2 a.m. on a Saturday because you lost your laptop, that's totally fine. Like, I'll take that call every day of the week. 
But if you roll in the office at like eight o'clock on Monday and it's like, ah, oh, I lost my laptop at the bar on Friday, like, can you help me out? Like, that would be a much different conversation. So I try to make myself available as many hours as I can. Uh, and we have it rotating through a bunch of people. But having something is better than having nothing because interesting things happen, right? <laughs> the engineers might see things that look a little odd. Maybe they drop it in a chat room and say, hey, this is strange. You know, some sort of cross-site scripting inside of an SSL cert. Um, Maybe they see an IP connection from an unknown source. Uh, maybe they see a database dump on a server. That's actually one of the most likely ones. Like, well, wait a second. We don't back up our databases that way. Why is there a database dump here? Because again, you have to remember, there's always going to be unusual attack vectors. So if you are doing, you know, doing the DevOps right, you're, you're giving access to a broader group of people. And this is a frightening reality to a lot of companies. They used to be able to lock you out, right? If you were a developer or an application builder, you were, you were essentially locked out of, of operation that platform. We know now that engineers build better systems when they're responsible for the health of those applications. Um, and so when we talk about giving safe access, we essentially mean monitor everything. It's the classic trust but verify. Um, there's a great quote from Mark Burgess. He's uh, the creator of CF Engine, kind of believed to be kind of the, the, the origin of, of configuration management. He says, every time someone logs into a system interactively, they compromise everyone's knowledge of that system. I think this not only applies to operators making different changes to the system, but it also applies to really anything that's happening on there. I mean, my greatest fear I have is engineers who are logging in while on call, they get an alert, it's maybe like 2 a.m. Maybe they install a package to fix an issue to get around it, and they're gonna go back the next day. And maybe they were good. Maybe they, you know, I'm gonna look at this diff of code before I you know, make this change. But the real issue is if they're doing you know, hot patching on the fly, uh, and they're pulling in dependencies of that code, or the transitive dependencies, which are much harder to track, now you have a, a system state that you cannot verify. And, it's, and, and they're gonna go back to bed and maybe they're gonna completely forget about it. So it's trust but verify. Uh, and we give a lot of trust to our engineers at Threat Staff. We really try to give people, if they're building the application, you're on call for that application. Um, and we are you know, kind of lucky we get to use Threat Stack to monitor Threat Stack so I can see things when, engine, when like a new process starts. Um, I can see a new service start. I can see this new connection got open. We can verify that people aren't like SCP and files around. You know, I've seen that before in our dev environment. We said, hey, you know, I see you SCP this file, you know, the server, like, are, why aren't you using our continuous you know, deployment pipeline? Um, and I use it as a training option. It's not to go up to them and be like, hey, I saw what you did, although my CEO trolls me all the time where I was on a server one time and I was fixing an issue and I typed my password in wrong, you know, for sudo and whoops, okay, try it again, did it wrong again, and I finally got it right. And he gets an alert for that, you know, invalid password attempts. And so he, he hits me up on, on chat and says, you type your password in wrong on, on the server? I was like, yeah, yeah. Twice? Really? I'm like, dude, I got a new keyboard. Like, just give me some time, right? So, you know, so these are things that, in that kind of hilarious situation, you know, it's the same scenario as like, he really wanted to find out because he knew that that's odd for me. It's odd for me to type my password in wrong so many times, right? So is that something else happening on there? Um, there are a lot of open source tools, like I said. Uh, Audit D, OSEC, that you can just pipe this, these events out to a log and you can monitor what your users are doing. Um, my joke there is open source is only free if your time is worth nothing. Remember that there is a human cost to open source. Um, and that's fine, like you should use open source and we should definitely improve a lot of those tools. But if you're a small company and you don't have the time, you can absolutely buy your way out of these problems. There's a lot of great tools out there to help you. So continuous security monitoring is more important that we treat our servers like cattle instead of pets. Uh, having security visibility through monitoring is, I would say, as just important as centralizing all of your application logs, as taking all your host-based metrics and getting them to a central place. I was at the AWS reInvent conference and there was a talk uh, with Steve Schmidt and the person I can't remember who's the head of security for the Amazon.com. And they were talking about how they stay secure in the cloud because they're literally moving Amazon.com to Amazon Web Services. And so the way that they, they do this, they say logging. They're logging everything. Everything that's happening gets logged. And he says, well, what do you want to be doing more of? I want to be logging more things. Um, he didn't say anything about, well, we're creating this awesome like alerting or whatever. It's like they're just capturing this data because they can do interesting stuff with that later. So start small. You don't have to boil the ocean. And it, it can seem super overwhelming if you're entered into a situation and you're trying to figure out, I need to secure everything out here. It's like you do, but you don't have to do it overnight. Um, go after your high risk targets. Go after anything public facing. Go after your VPN systems. Um, if you work to data instrument some sort of monitoring, security monitoring into your systems, the same way that you would monitor the health of your application, I think it sets you up to do really interesting stuff. The ultimate thing that I always like to talk about is that this is not a technical problem. 
When we're trying to get security teams and developer teams and operations teams and really sales teams and everyone else together, this is a people problem. Being the security asshole, it just doesn't work anymore. Um, I think a lot of empathy goes a long way. And that goes on both sides. You know, knowing that the security team needs to ensure and we need to pass audits and we have these PCI systems that exist there for a reason. And so having empathy for those people as well as the other side, it's definitely a two-way street. So my message to all the InfoSec teams out there that are wary of kind of the DevOps, uh, community is welcoming you with open arms. You know, one thing that, like I said, this is my first security conference. I've given this talk at DevOps conferences and people are like, yeah, security, I really should start doing something with that. But what I'd love to see is more security content making its way to those types of conferences, to the developer and application, to the, oper uh, the operators conferences, the high velocity, whatever. You know, these are things that are going to help improve how we all work. Because honestly, it's not that people don't want to do this. It's honestly, they just don't know. Um, I've talked with operators that, you know, hey, what are the things that you want to know more about kind of the security of your system? I'm like, well, I, I just don't know. I, I, like, they just don't even know how to answer it. Um, so this is learning all around. The, just remember though, the best security cultures are collaborative though. They're not prescriptive. Um, we all understand business has to get done, but if you're trying to drive progress with fear, I think you're gonna find yourself on a losing battle. Um, I don't think it's gonna be getting easier, right? Uh, fridges are giving out your personal data. They're sending spam in these massive botnet attacks. Uh, they might even link your Gmail credentials. Um, I don't know who's making these fridges, but they really need to stop. Um, the cool thing is we have a much greater awareness of security. Uh, everyone is talking about it. I mean, both of my parents, you know, they worked in factories. They are the, probably the least two tech, technical people that I know of, and they're getting it now. They're understanding that there are security risks and the number of times they've had to change their credit card because it's been stolen. And the great news, like I said, is what we're talking about it. With the Internet of Things, again, it's going to get harder. And I don't even call it the Internet of Things. I call it the Internet of Vulnerable Refrigerators because, as we just learned, clearly it's those that are killing it. And again, this is one of those scenarios where I had like five slides of all of these, like there's a teapot that you know, you know, could leak your credentials or something. I mean, there's so many things that we're putting these chips in with a, without a second thought. But again, we're talking about it, we're trying to improve it. And I say this to all the people that are out there, you know, as you talk with more people, let's learn from each other. I wanna learn from all of you. I, I'm really excited for a lot of the talks here today because I wanna help learn how we can all together build, manage, and scale our systems much more securely. Thanks everyone, appreciate it.